than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and Okay, let's get started. Uh, so today's lecture is about the, uh, the long-awaited uh, buffer pool topic. Which we, I feel like we've been talking about it for uh, weeks by now, but it's finally here. Uh, before we get going, just a few administrative things to discuss. So uh, project number one, which was released on Monday, will be due on Sunday, September 26th at 11.59 p.m. Uh, there's going to be a, a Q&A session um, to, to cover any, you know, more detailed questions about the project uh, uh, on Thursday, September 16th, which is tomorrow at 4 p.m. And there is a Zoom link posted on Piazza um, where you can go and join. And just, I, I would encourage everyone to, uh, if you haven't yet um, gotten started on the project, at least take a look um, through all the, the uh, information on the assignment page and in the, the, um, the, the code so that way you can ask you know, more detailed questions or if you, if you do attend the um, Q&A session, you'll be better able to, to absorb uh, the, the details that are being discussed. Um, there was also a question last class uh, about um, hardware support for fixed point arithmetic it was one of the topics we covered last time. Um, I looked around a little bit uh, I, I, I couldn't really find um, any uh, specific information about you know modern hardware using um, uh, specialized uh, components for fixed point arithmetic. Um, I think there there were some early attempts at this, like uh, you know the 1960s from IBM had some specialized hardware for it, um, but nothing recent or modern. Um, I think I, I have seen some things uh, where FPGAs have been programmed to, to handle it specifically, but um, other than that, I haven't, I haven't seen um, any, any work on it. Cool. So um, kind of the, the two problems that we've been uh, talking about so far, um, problem number one, which was the topic of, of some of the last lectures, was how does the DBMS represent database files on disk? Talked a lot about uh, how, how database files are stored as pages, how pages are stored in internally, and how uh, tuples are stored within those pages. So that's kind of been the focus um, of, of the previous couple of lectures. And now uh, we're going to be transitioning to talking about the second problem, which is how does the DBMS manage um, its memory and move data back and forth from disk? Remember, uh, this is one of the, the important features we talked about uh, that we want the DBMS itself to manage rather than leaving it up to the operating system. So um, it's going to be an important topic uh, f f in this lecture and, and you'll see going forward. So the way that you can think about kind of this, this um, database storage and, and memory management problem is in two uh, kind of dimensions. The first is in terms of uh, uh, spatial control which is where we're thinking about where uh, physically to write pages on disk. So where do we want to store the pages on disk um, for uh, maximum benefit? And the goal is to, to be able to keep pages together, so co-locate co them or um, have them uh, laid out contiguously on disk um, if they're frequently accessed together by our applications. So if you have a query that needs to touch multiple disk pages, uh, ideally, what you'd want to be able to do is lay those disk, disk pages out um, as close as possible together. And again, the reason, remember, you want to do this is because uh, uh, sequential access on disk is a lot less expensive than, than random access. So if you, know, you can seek to a particular spot where you know a bunch of the pages you'll need are uh, for your query, then you can get all of those in one shot rather than having to seek around to a, a bunch of different locations on disk. So that's kind of the spatial control aspect. Uh, the, the second aspect that we need to consider is uh, temporal control. So what, what this means is that um, when, when we're going to be fetching pages from disk into memory, we want the DBMS um, to be able to do it in a way that minimizes disk stalls. So what does that mean? It means that if there's a page that you need 
and it currently doesn't reside in memory, uh, your query or your application, your program is going to block while um, the, the DBMS goes and reads in the page that you need from disk. So there's going to be this I.O. stall waiting for a page to come in, and we want to try to avoid those as much as possible. So that means what we would like to have happen is the DBMS to figure out um, an efficient way to keep pages um, that are going to be accessed at the same time in memory together at the same time. So these are kind of the two uh, uh, different um, dimensions we need to consider uh, when, when building our, our buffer pool. And we'll kind of talk about all the different ways that um, the uh, system, the, the DBMS is going to, to uh, handle this. So just, uh, uh, I, I showed this slide in, in um, a previous lecture and just to kind of hammer home this point, um, if you think about kind of the different time scales that, that um, uh, are in play here, we have, you know, data we can access in memory uh, in the normalized scale is on the order of 100 seconds. Going to disk, traditional, you know, disk is on the order of 16.5 weeks. So um, it's really important for uh, us as, as DBMS engineers to figure out an efficient way to maintain this buffer pool to keep things um, in memory as, as much as possible. So uh, again, so far we've kind of been talking at, at this disk layer, um, at the database file, you know, you have your, your database file stored on disk, it's split up into a bunch of pages. You have this directory page that, that um, stores the mappings from page IDs to physical uh, locations or offsets in the file. And um, this, is, this is kind of what's, what's happening on disk, what we've talked about so far. So the next layer in, in the stack is this buffer pool, which we've uh, referred to before. And the buffer pool is going to exist in memory. So just, again, thinking at a high level, there's this execution engine piece, which we'll cover in later lectures. But the way that the buffer pool is going to work is it's going to serve requests to the execution engine. So we have the execution engine, for example, issues a request for page number two. There's no page number two currently in our buffer pool. So what the buffer pool is going to do is load the file directory first um, into memory, figure out where physically page number two resides, and then go fetch it so that uh, we can return a pointer back to our execution engine. So this is kind of at a high level how uh, the, the whole buffer pool process is going to work. So specifically, um, the topics that we're going to cover in today's lecture are again this, this high level idea of the buffer pool and specifically the buffer pool manager. So the, the piece of the software or the, the um, spot in the software stack that's responsible uh, for managing the buffer pool. Sometimes it's referred to as a buffer cache. You may see that. Um, uh, but we're going to take a look at kind of the, the different algorithms that um, the, the buffer pool manager employs, including replacement policies for how to decide, you know, which pages uh, to read in, which pages to evict. And then finally, we're going to look at some other um, uh, types of memory pools that can exist in the DBMS. Uh, so this is the agenda for the lecture. And then I, I allocated some time also at the end of um, class where we can just have a high level um, introduction and discussion of, of project number one. So the buffer pool is organized uh, it, it basically as um, a memory region that's just an array of these fixed size pages. So each array entry in the buffer pool is called a frame and it's going to be the size of the disk page so that we can map um, disk pages into the slots in uh, the buffer pool. So when the DBMS requests a page, what we're going to do is essentially load or copy um, an exact replica of the page into one of these uh, frames in our buffer pool. So for example, let's say we need page one, the buffer pool manager is going to load that page uh, and stick it in one of the frames in our buffer pool. Similarly, if we need page three, that can go in the buffer pool. and uh, we need actually one more layer of indirection now to be able to access these pages. So that's what's going to be called the page table. 
So the page table essentially keeps track of the mappings um, of the pages that are stored in memory. So similar to how kind of the um, uh, the, the uh, header file, or sorry, the header for the file uh, page directory keeps track of where the pages reside in um, on disk. Uh, the page table is going to keep track of how the pages are uh, laid out, uh, where, where they exist in the buffer pool in memory. Um, so here we have you know the mappings from pages one and three to their their frames in the buffer pool. Uh, the page table is also going to be responsible for maintaining some additional metadata uh, about each of the pages. And we'll talk later in the lecture about why this is important. But for now, just um, keep in mind that we're going to keep track of things, for example, like a dirty flag, which is going to tell us, you know, it's just a, a Boolean value that tells us whether or not uh, the page has been modified since it was loaded into memory. So we can't make updates to things directly on disk. We have to load them into memory. If there's a write that happens, we want to, to notate that by setting this dirty uh, flag. We're also going to keep track of uh, things like a, a pin or a reference counter. So um, what that means is uh, if, if we want uh, a particular page to remain in memory in the buffer pool, we don't want it to be evicted. Um, we're going to keep track of some kind of counter that lets us know that certain queries or applications are using the page so it doesn't, uh, the buffer pool manager doesn't evict it. So there, you can keep you know, all kinds of other um, uh, metadata about pages, but just these are probably the most important ones that, that we'll cover. So again, you know, if we want to make sure that page three stays around, we can just set this uh, pin on it, basically just a counter that says some, some um, query somewhere is using it. Um, you know, now, if, if we have a bunch of these concurrently running queries and one comes along and, and wants to uh, you know, fetch uh, another page um, from disk into memory, then we can run into these kind of concurrency issues where uh, we have multiple threads or concurrent queries all accessing, trying to uh, modify this page table. So basically what we do is a, a, a thread will set uh, a latch on a um, position in the page table to, to prevent um, concurrent uh, modifications to it and then ask for the page to be loaded in. So page number two gets loaded in and then um, we add this mapping from the page table to the buffer pool uh, so that you know we know where it is and then uh, the, the thread can release its latch. So that's kind of how uh, everything works at a high level and throughout the lecture we'll go through the different algorithms that, that we use to um, do these uh, evictions and, and uh, loads from disk. So an important distinction, um, I, I said uh, latch on the previous slide, so uh, threads are going to put latches on the page table. Uh, there's sort of this long-standing feud uh, between people who are in databases or database uh, research and people who are in the broader systems community, uh, or if you're coming from an OS course or something, um, what database people refer to as latches versus locks is different than what systems people refer to um, locks versus latches. So uh, I'm going to talk about how data, database people talk about it because we're in a, a database class. So typically when database people are talking about locks, uh, they're referring to kind of these high level um, uh, abstractions that protect uh, the, like the logical contents of the database. So that could be things like whole tables, that could be like uh, an index, that could be uh, tuples, just things that are logical abstractions um, that are, are related to pieces of, of the DBMS. And locks are typically held for the, the duration of a transaction. So we haven't talked exactly about what a transaction is, but you can think about like uh, for the duration of a query. Um, and it's important that if, if a query is acquiring locks, then it needs to be able to roll back its changes. So kind of locks are, are a, a higher level concept. When you talk about latches in, in a database management system, uh, we're, we're typically referring to uh, short-lived um, uh, latching that protects kind of these critical sections 
of like a, 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 an internal data structure or a, a modification that's going on um, in the DBMS, and we don't need to be able to roll back the changes. So this is what it, it would it maps to like a, a mutex. So again, I, I think I uh, mentioned this uh, distinction. So the page table uh, resides in memory in the buffer pool and the page directory resides uh, on disk for the file. So the page directory is this mapping from um, page IDs to the physical locations of the pages. It could be an offset in a file, it could be a directory somewhere. Um, but the point is this is, needs to be persisted um, so that way we can uh, load it in the future in order to track down individual pages we might need. The page table um, is just going to be in, in memory. It's ephemeral. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to persist it. So the page table can get built up um, over time as we're executing queries. And then, you know, if the system shuts down or we lose power or something, it, it's okay if it gets wiped out. We don't need to keep track of it for the future because um, you know, when we start up again and we start issuing new queries, it's going to look completely different. So it's kind of just this in-memory data structure that allows us to um, track page IDs where they're located in the frames of the buffer pool. Uh, there's a question, yes. What's the loop any updates that we make to the page that has a period there, right? So if the system shuts down, then we could potentially lose some recent pages, but So the, the question is, um, Will we lose updates to pages uh, with the dirty bit set? So pages that have been written or modified somehow uh, by a query. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So um, yes. So if there are uh, pages stored in the buffer pool with the dirty bit set, um, it means that they were modified by some query and they have not yet been persisted to disk. So uh, we haven't really talked about transactions or, or um, transactional guarantees yet, but typically um, the way that's going to work is if you have a query that's running in a, in a transactional manner, then uh, you, you don't want to say that your uh, query is complete or it's called committed. You don't, you don't want to say that your, your query is finished executing until all of the changes have been persisted to disk in some way. So that could either be through uh, a, a database log, a write-ahead log, which we also have not covered yet, but um, either through a write-ahead log or by ensuring that the uh, dirty pages in the buffer pool have been flushed to disk. So uh, it's, it's possible if, if the, the system crashes or you lose power or something, um, before that happens, then you'll lose what happened, uh, you, you'll lose any modifications in in those pages. Does that make sense? Great. Are there any other questions? Great. Okay. So kind of uh, just a, a recap, that's the difference between you know page table, page directory. Page table is in memory in the buffer uh, buffer pool, page directory is persisted uh, on disk. So when we're trying to figure out um, kind of how we're going to lay out or uh, decide which pages are going to exist uh, in our buffer pool, um, we have two ways of doing it. And there's, there's trade-offs between the two. We'll, we'll kind of discuss and see cases where one might be preferable over the other. But uh, these are kind of at a high level the two uh, competing approaches. On the one side, you have some kind of global policy for your buffer pool, which is going to make uh, decisions for all active transactions or queries. So it, it kind of sees all of the queries that are running concurrently in the system um, at one time, and it tries to, to uh, best figure out how to manage the um, buffer pool globally. On the other side of the spectrum is uh, this idea of local policies where um, individual transactions or queries are going to uh, allocate, deallocate, you know, uh, load and evict pages um, on, a, on a per query basis. So they're only going to consider, uh, you know, the execution model that they have. They're not going to think about any of the other concurrently running queries in the system at the same time. 
Now, this doesn't mean that you know, it, it, uh, we, we don't share pages, so the pages are still going to be shared, but when we're making decisions um, about which pages to either load or uh, evict from the buffer pool, uh, we're just going to consider the needs of individual queries. We're not going to try and globally optimize across queries. So kind of their trade-offs to using each, we'll, we'll go into the details about uh, some of those, but this, this at a high level are, are kind of the two uh, options we're trying to balance. So some of the buffer pool optimizations we're going to talk about, um, we'll start off kind of with the simpler ideas and move to more complicated. Uh, multiple, using multiple uh, concurrent buffer pools at the same time rather than just one, uh, using different, different prefetching techniques, um, scaring shan, uh, scan sharing across multiple queries, and um, using some kind of buffer pool bypass mechanism um, for uh, individual queries. So we'll start with the multiple buffer pools idea. Um, logically, uh, you know, the, the DBMS has one kind of buffer pool where you uh, load pages from disk into memory, but um, physically that could be implemented as multiple uh, individual buffer pools with different strategies. So for example, you could have um, multiple buffer pools running just uh, on, on the machine. You could have a per database buffer pool. So if you have multiple concurrent databases that are managed by your system, each one could have its own buffer pool. Uh, you could even have a different buffer pool at the level of individual pages. So if you have different types of pages, uh, for example, maybe pages for uh, tables, uh, versus pages for indexes, um, those could be handled by completely separate buffer pools. And there are a lot of advantages. One is that uh, it helps to reduce the uh, latch contention, so there's, there's less fighting over uh, managing a, um, a single page table. And it also allows you to specialize buffer pools for uh, each buffer pool instance for individual uh, the, the needs of individual either queries or databases or um, uh, page types. So kind of these are, these are some examples of systems that allow you to have um, multiple concurrent buffer pools running uh, with different um, uh, strategies inside each. So can anyone think of you know, a problem that might come up if we do decide rather than just having one you know, big buffer pool that all of all of my pages are going to go into. If we decide to split it up into a bunch of smaller buffer pools, what might a problem be? Yes. Okay. So the comment is that how do you decide how much space to allocate each buffer pool? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think in most of these uh, cases that each system uh, ha has some kind of knob that the database administrator needs to tune to figure out. You know, they in theory, know what's going on uh, at the application level, so they decide how to how to split it up. Um, so yes, that is a, a, a problem. Can anyone else think of a different problem? Uh, so the the comment is: Could you have multiple of the same pages in different buffer pools? Uh, yes, that could be a problem. Uh, typically, the way these things are implemented um, is to make sure that pages are mapped to a single buffer pool. So kind of if I rephrase the comment, um, this is actually going to bring to the next slide, uh, it's essentially how do you figure out if you have a page and you want it to go to one and only one buffer pool, how do you figure out which buffer pool the page is going to go to? So um, here we have two buffer pools and kind of there are two common approaches, there may be others, but these are kind of the, the most widely used. Uh, the first approach is that when you're storing pages, um, you store some kind of object ID associated with it. So by an object ID, I mean uh, kind of the type of page that we're dealing with. So for example, it could be a page that stores uh, tuples in a table. It could be a page that stores um, part of an index data structure. Uh, it could be a page that stores log records. So just kind of an object ID that's going to identify um, for, for the DBMS what type of page it's dealing with. So just as an example, um, 
Q, let's say Q1 wants to get this record one, two, three. So some, somewhere in the, the one, two, three, we have embedded this, this object ID. Let's just say it's, you know, the first, the first digit is the object ID, the second is the page ID, and the third is the, the slot number for that record. So kind of if we look at our object ID here, um, the system might know, okay, objects with object ID number one are going to map to buffer pool one. So uh, kind of at, at a high level, this allows the system to split up um, different types of pages into different buffer pools. The second approach, uh, which is also pretty straightforward, is we're just going to take some hash of the uh, record ID. So we have record ID one, two, three. We're going to take a hash and then modulo times the number of uh, independent buffer pools that we have. And again here, you know, maybe it just tells us to go to, to buffer pool one, whatever the result of that uh, hash function modulo is. So basically what this is allowing us to do is, you know, have multiple different buffer pools where we map different, um, we can figure out the, the page, page mapping to uh, an individual buffer pool so the system knows where, where to go look for uh, that page. Okay, so uh, the, the next important optimization we're going to talk about um, is, is uh, prefetching. Um, so kind of the idea is that the, the DBMS um, can go and prefetch pages uh, based on a query plan before they're actually needed. So kind of what, what we've looked at so far is we have a query executing and we fetch the pages as you know, they're needed for processing but there's nothing stopping the DBMS from, you know, in advance before the pages are actually needed, going and fetching them uh, from disk and loading them into the buffer pool for us. So we'll look uh, specifically at, at these two uh, types of plans. There are many others, but just these two um, query operators here kind of illustrate the, the uh, point of, of having some intelligent prefetching mechanism. Um, so the, the disk pages are again laid out in, in order. Remember, you know, it's, it's a heap, so they're unordered, so they might not be in this exact order, uh, but just for illustration purposes, they are. So imagine we have a query that comes in and, and you know, wants to start accessing pages. So Q1 starts executing. First, it accesses page zero. We load page zero from disk into the buffer pool. Then it moves on and accesses page one loads page one into the buffer pool. Now, if this is a, a sequential scan, um, Q1 is going to need to access page two and page three next. So we've already done zero, now one. It's gonna need two and three next. So why not allow the DBMS to map these pages you know, ahead of time for us into the buffer pool so we don't have to wait for them to be mapped? So the DBMS can perform some kind of prefetching figures out, okay, let's put page two in this empty slot down the bottom. Page uh, three, well, we already used page zero. We don't need to look at that again, so let's evict that and load in page three into that uh, slot there. So now, when query one moves on to page two, we find out it's already in the buffer pool, and if kind of we keep this, this pattern up, then Q1 is never going to be blocked waiting for um, uh, some kind of disk or uh, file I.O. stall. So kind of another uh, situation you might run into that was a sequential scan. Uh, in this query here, um, we're, we're basically asking for uh, values between 100 and 250. So we want to go get all of the, the tuples from uh, the pages where the values fall in that range. It's obviously not going to be all, all of the um, uh, pages. So we can use uh, a data structure called an index. And again, we haven't really talked about indexes. This um, typically they're, they're uh, index data structures that are used uh, most widely are uh, B trees or B plus trees. Uh, we'll cover them in a later lecture, but you can think of this just for now as basically like a, like a binary tree. So um, just, a, just a you know, standard tree data structure. So 
At the root node, we're going to have page zero and kind of the, the pages uh, descend from there. So if, if this um, uh, tree is organized based on kind of the uh, uh, value that, that we're searching on, then all of the values are sorted in this order here and we can, rather than having to scan all of the uh, pages in the file, we can just traverse the tree which is going to tell us which pages we need to go and look at. So we're going to start kind of at this, at this uh, root page. We need to load that from disk into memory so we know kind of where we are at, at the root. And then kind of descend the tree uh, to find just the range that we're interested in for the query. So kind of we start at the, the root, get that page in, get the next page in, and so forth. Until now we get down to the leaf nodes and all of the leaf nodes um, have pointers connecting them so we can just sort of scan right across um, in, in consecutive pages for the uh, a range that we're interested in. Now you'll notice that here um, the, the pages we have consecutive are in, the, in the leaf layer are page three and page five. So what we're gonna have to do is some kind of you know, more intelligent prefetching um, the first two, you know, were, were sequential, but now we have to jump to these um, later pages. So, kind of, oops, sorry. So the um, uh, difference here from the sequential scan is we have to know uh, specifically at the level of uh, the buffer pool manager what the access patterns are for the query. So kind of if we treated this the same as we did the sequential scan, we'd end up reading in pages that we don't really need, like index page two. Whereas if we know specifically that this is an index scan, um, we can prefetch in uh, exactly the pages that we need. Yes? So the question is, when we have uh, just index page one right here, how do we know that we'll need uh, index page three and then index page five? Is that the question? Okay. So um, the, the uh, answer is that unlike the sequential scan where we know all of the pages are contiguous, we know something about the high level layout of uh, the data structure. So we, we kind of know at a high level how the pages uh, in the index are laid out and based on you know, whether we're traversing left or right in the tree, we know which page we need to, to fetch next. When you get down to the leaf layer, um, there are uh, uh, pointers across all of them that uh, uh, allow you to, to scan directly across. You don't have to traverse down the, the other side of the index. So we were looking at the content. Yes, correct, yes, yes. Yes. So the question is, how are the system resources that are used for prefetching accounted for? Uh, so you mean like how how does the system um, know how to allocate resources to? Yeah, like the kind of or like Okay, so so uh, the question is like how how do you know how much uh, how how many resources you should allocate to doing this prefetching versus what, you know normal work that's going on in the system? That's a good question. Um, there uh, has been a lot of work about prefetching in the academic community and typically um, in commercial systems uh, it is a big selling point. There's a lot of work put into kind of uh, better buffer pool man managers broadly, but um, in particular prefetching, better prefetching and figuring out you know, exactly how much effort to devote to um, prefetching in this way. So, you know, if you if you spend too much of your resources kind of doing prefetching, then you kind of uh, uh, hinder the real work that's going on in the system. Versus, if you don't do any, then you can end up with these uh, I/O stalls. So it's a delicate balance, kind of you have to strike between the two. Um, typically, and we'll see this in in some of the other um, strategies. There are there are ways to mitigate uh, allocating too much effort to. Uh, prefetch. So usually you can think about it like just in a simple way if, if there's idle time or idle resources uh, in the system you can use them to perform these optimizations sort of in the background. 
but uh, certainly it's it's difficult because you don't want to you know like I said hinder the work being done by actual uh, executing queries. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, so, so yeah, sorry. You, you're asking the uh, database. I don't know. Is, I that was interesting. Um, so the, the, your 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 statement is that the the database files, as well as the uh, index pages, are both stored in the buffer pool. Yeah. Yes, they they are they are both stored in the buffer pool. Um, they may. Uh, uh, like I said, in some cases, if you're splitting the buffer pool into to smaller pieces, um, they may be split up. So like in the object ID case, you could have um, uh, one buffer pool just for the database files, separate buffer pool for the indexes. But uh, at, at a high level, yes, they share the same buffer pool. Uh, so the, the statement is, is there uh, or there should be prefetching in both dimensions, both for the, the um, database pages, file pages, as well as the index pages. Yes, so uh, you, you could have, uh, I guess it depends, you know, sort of if you uh, split it up into multiple buffer pools, um, you could have a, one prefetcher per buffer pool. Um, if, if you have a, a kind of a shared buffer pool, then you know, the, the one single buffer pool manager needs to figure out how to you know, balance the, the uh, resources between database files and index files. We'll talk more about index files later um, in, in uh, the semester, but kind of in some cases you can answer queries entirely just by looking at the index. You don't even need to go to the database files. So, um, there's kind of a balance between uh, uh, keeping both of those in, in the same buffer pool. Yes? So, so, so the, yeah, the question is, what is the number along the bottom of the tree? Uh, so in this, this query here, uh, there is just some some field in the table, some attribute called value. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you, you the, you're asking, does does the index just store the value? I, oh, oh, I understand. So, so your the the question is: Is the index uh, built exclusively for this query, or it, does it depend on this query? Uh, the answer is no. So, indexes are data structures that are built independent of queries. They're just maintained by the system, but they can be used to answer many queries. So, just think about this for, for now, just like a binary tree that we're going to store that sorts. Uh, these these values between you know zero and three ninety nine or whatever it is, those are stored in the database file in pages. So they're part of tuples that that live in pages in a database file. We're just building this auxiliary data structure that uh, sorts those values for us, and that that index can get built by the system and then reused to answer as many queries as you have that touch that um, uh, value. Does that make sense? Okay, so if there are no more questions about prefetching, uh, then we can move on to the next optimization. Uh, it is called scan sharing. Uh, basically, the idea is that queries can reuse the data that is retrieved from storage uh, or potentially operator computations by other queries. So this is also called synchronized scans. Um, it's different from result caching, so I'm not talking about like you know, you issue a query and it computes, you know, how many students are in this, this uh, course or something. And then you have another query that asks a similar question, how many students are in the course, and you just reuse the result. Um, I'm, I'm more talking about the individual data pages. So if a query is reading pages from disk and putting them in memory, 
um, you can have a, um, a, another query that needs to access the same pages, reuse them. So it allows basically multiple queries to attach to a single cursor that's scanning a table. So the queries don't have to be the same, uh, that's not a requirement, but they, they do have to be accessing the same data or they, they need to be looking at the same pages in order to make sense. Otherwise, uh, this optimization wouldn't be possible. Um, so basically you can think about it like if there's a, a query that wants to scan a table and you have another query already scanning the same table, the DBMS can attach the, the new query, the second query is uh, a cursor to the existing cursor. So cursor is just an iterator basically over the pages in a table. Um, there are lots of examples of uh, uh, systems that do this, some at different levels. For example, Oracle, uh, the, the cursors need to be, or sorry, the, the uh, queries need to be identical to do cursor sharing. Um, there, uh, in previous versions of this lecture, um, I, Andy uh, uh, misspoke. Uh, there are some people who are very upset online about this. Uh, fortunately, I am much more careful than Andy, so I don't make these sorts of mistakes. But um, on Stack Overflow, uh, someone um, uh, posted this after watching one of the previous year's lectures about um, uh, Andy said that it, it doesn't exist in uh, Postgres. Um, ignore the comment about uh, his hygiene. I don't know, that's just... Uh, I, I mean, like t technical, technical disagreements are fine, but I think that's a step too far personally. Uh, so uh, if you go and look at the, the Postgres documentation in newer um, versions, they, they do support this called synchronized sequential scans. Um, and you can either enable or disable this uh, in the system um, by passing a, a configuration uh, parameter to it. So how does scan sharing work? Uh, well, imagine we have this one query here, really simple. Basically, you just want to select uh, the sum of all of the values from some table A. So again, we're going to go um, get the uh, uh, disk pages that we need. So first, you know, query one is going to fetch page zero, page one, page two. So when we move on to page three, we need to figure out, hey, let's evict a page. We'll talk more about how to choose pages for eviction in a minute, but Basically, you know, we need to take page zero, uh, throw it out, and replace it with page three. So now imagine at this point in the query execution, so we're already down to page three here, another query comes along, we'll call it query two, um, and it's trying to do basically the same thing, except instead of computing a sum, it's computing an average. So kind of the same scan over, over the table, uh, just a different aggregate. So this, it's gonna have to look at all the, the same pages. So you know, we could start query two up here and start scanning from the beginning, uh, but kind of, you know, we, we've already looked at those pages um, for query one. So an alternative that we can do in this uh, scan sharing approach is we're actually going to attach query two's cursor to uh, uh, query, query one's cursor and start from the same position uh, in the scan. So we're gonna start at page three rather than at the beginning. So now they're gonna to go together through the, the remainder of the pages, four and five, and now query one is finished. It, it looked at all the pages it needed to. Query two needs to restart from the beginning and kind of scan through only the pages that it hasn't seen before. So it knows, you know, it started at page three, it has to go back and look at the um, pages that query one already looked at uh, before um, uh, it, it started. So this is a, a, a good example where um, we talked a lot about how uh, the, the uh, relational model and SQL doesn't assume any kind of ordering. It's just a set or multi-set um, uh, algebra. So there's, there's no relationship uh, with how or in what order um, tuples are stored. And this is a, an example of how you, know, you can still get the same sum, you can still get the same average depending on where you start uh, in the scan, looking at different pages. So in, in some cases, uh, in particular, if you have some kind of limit clause on your query, this can cause a problem, because now uh, if I issue this query multiple times, I could potentially get different answers. So uh, there, there's no determinism um, that forces the DBMS to give me the same 100 
uh, um, tuples, I could issue this query two times in a row and get you know two uh, different results, assuming there are more than 100 tuples. But um, kind of this is something to be careful about if you're if you're trying to impose uh, um, uh, or assume ordering logic for a limit. If there's no ordering clause, then a limit can give you you know just 100 tuples from any of these pages, and it's it's equally correct. Okay, so are there any questions about scan sharing? Yes? Is this just a very different problem? Like, because directory of multiple queries, then there's a big query. You have to decide which one to pick first, and then you have to decide which one to pick first, and then you have to get specific logic for that. And moreover, you will have to store that query for some time because you have to synchronize. What is this kind of happening? So I, there's, there's two parts to the question. The first part is um, imagine you have multiple queries running, so more than just two. You have to figure out which query you want to attach to, right? Because you, know, you could have multiple running. Um, uh, yes, that's a, a good point. Uh, there are probably different trade-offs um, depending on. Uh, so these two queries are scanning the exact same range. I imagine you would want to try to maximize, you'd want to try to attach to the query that maximizes the scanned range because otherwise like you you want to try and get the 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 most queries attached to the longest running query if that makes sense so uh, there are different trade-offs uh, absolutely uh, we're not going to go into any details about kind of more intelligent algorithms for deciding when to attach um, there's a research project recently kind of they uh, uh, would would start scans only from the beginning. You get like, I don't know, thousands or something of these concurrent queries. They all attach to one scan, start, scan all the way through to the end. And any new queries that came in since then just block waiting for the loop to get back around to the beginning. So um, th there is a fair amount of, of logic or difficulty that goes into um, uh, achieving that. Uh, can you remind me what the second part of the question was? So uh, the, the question is, do you have to stall the query while you're attaching to it? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, so there is some overhead associated with doing this. You have to you know, block one while you're waiting. Otherwise, you, you're gonna, there, there has to be some synchronization mechanism. Um, and I think the, the uh, question you have to answer before you decide to do it is, is it going to be worth the trouble of doing that. I mean, if, if you're waiting on a disk stall, then you know any synchronization you do um, in memory in the CPU is it's going to be uh, irrelevant. Uh, it's going to be completely masked by the disk I/O. So um, maybe you know if the query is at the very end of the very last page that it needs to look at, it doesn't make sense to attach to it. So again, yeah, there there are trade-offs you need to consider when uh, figuring out when to 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 apply this optimization. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so the question is, can you attach all queries to the same cursor, the same scan together? Uh, and if uh, I, I didn't catch the part about the joints. If there, I, okay, so if, sure, you could attach as many, in theory, as many uh, queries as you want to the same scan. Um, if there are joins or other sorts of things uh, that access pages from other tables, um, then, uh, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, I guess you, you could attach uh, queries to uh, individual scans in a query plan. So imagine, you know, they all happen to scan this table A and then Query one scanned table B next, and query two scanned table C. They could attach for the same you know, portion of, of table A scan that they're doing and then diverge for the other two. Um, sure, you could have you know, arbitrarily complex schemes like that. But again, you kind of have to weigh the overhead of kind of figuring out the, the best um, uh, scan sharing plan versus uh, actually you know, doing it. So the, the advantages it would give you. Does that answer the question? Okay, so uh, the, the uh, next, I think this is the last one, um, optimization that I wanna talk about is uh, buffer pool bypass. 
So uh, basically, what the, the sequential scan operator is going to do is it's not going to store um, the, the fetched pages, it's, it's not going to persist the fetched pages in the buffer pool in order to avoid overhead. So basically, what this is doing is, you know, it, it fetches it into the buffer pool, and then it says, okay, I'm, I'm never going to need this again, so you can overwrite it or evict it right away. Because you're doing this sequential scan, you've already looked at pages, you don't need to look at them again. So um, this, in theory, is, is pretty straightforward to do. Uh, there are some tricky details around it. Um, they're called different, I think they're called light, light scans and Informix um, and different uh, uh, systems uh, supported in, in varying um, degrees. So, okay, so those are, those are all of the um, kind of uh, uh, optimizations we're going to talk about at the level of the buffer pool. The next piece we need to get to is um, the different strategies for uh, replacing pages in the buffer pool if the buffer pool fills up. So most disk operations that we're going to perform go, th uh, go through the, the uh, APIs provided by the OS. Remember we talked about MMAP or alternatives like read and write. Um, and unless you tell it not to, the operating system is going to maintain its own file system cache. Um, it's usually called the page cache. Basically what this is, is uh, the operating system, when you're, when you're requesting to uh, read a page from disk, what's going to happen is that request is going to go to the operating system. The operating system is going to go, if it's not already loaded, going to go fetch it from disk, load it into the page cache, and then return a pointer uh, to the page to you that you then have to copy from uh, the OS page cache into user space. So, you're ending up with a redundant copy of the page here, one stored in the OS page cache, one stored in your buffer pool that you've implemented. So what most DBMSs do is use this uh, odirect flag to bypass the OS's page cache. So basically you're telling the OS, uh, just you know, read this page in for me, I'm gonna take care of it, you can, don't cache it, don't keep it around, um, I'll, I'll take care of it from here. So, um, if, if, you, if you rely on this kind of caching mechanism from the OS, you have all these different bad properties that we talked about in, in the previous lecture. So kind of what most systems do, again, is, is use this odirect flag to um, prevent the OS from keeping a separate redundant cache um, uh, in the page cache. So there are, there are different strategies that we can employ to figure out um, which pages to keep around in memory when uh, the, the buffer pool fills up. So we need, you know, we, we're out of space, we need to free up a frame in order to get a new page in. How are we going to decide which pages to get rid of or evict from uh, our, our buffer pool? There are different goals kind of that we need to balance uh, as we're deciding um, on an algorithm to use. And they include, you know, correctness. We don't want to have any um, uh, issues where our, our data gets corrupted, for example, by uh, throwing away or, or not properly writing out um, dirty pages. Um, we want our answers to be accurate. It's a, a similar concern. Speed, we want, we want to do the replacement quickly. If you spend all your time thinking about, you know, the optimal page to evict, then you might uh, spend more time doing that than actually the benefit you would get from having an intelligent uh, algorithm. Uh, and finally, we need to be worried about kind of about how much uh, metadata we're storing in order to do the eviction. So we kind of need to, in designing an algorithm, choosing an algorithm, we need to balance all of these concerns. So the, the most straightforward one, and this is used in a lot of places um, in, in different systems areas, uh, it's called the least recently used or LRU policy. Uh, basically what we're going to do is for each page, we're going to maintain a single timestamp of when it was last accessed by uh, a query. So just you know, one field that says the timestamp of when this page was last accessed. And then when the DBMS needs to evict a page, um, it's pretty straightforward. We just go and find the page with the oldest timestamp, which means that it was least recently accessed. And kind of the intuition here is that, you know, more recently used, so uh, uh, 
pages that we have accessed more recently are going to be more useful. So this could happen, you know, if there's skew in your workload and there are a couple pages that you need to access frequently, um, it could come up with that or uh, different other access patterns. So there's some kind of um, uh, t temporal uh, aspect of the access that, you know, we, the intuition is we want to get rid of. If we haven't looked at the page in a while, we can just get rid of it. Um, and of course, you know, you, you can keep the pages in some kind of sorted order using a, some kind of data structure, uh, like a heap data structure or something to um, figure out, you know, which one is, is uh, the, the least recently used one you want to evict. So uh, kind of a, a little bit uh, of a variation on LRU uh, is this clock strategy, and this also gets used a lot. Um, it's, it's basically like an approximation of LRU, so rather than storing uh, a complete timestamp per page, we're just going to allocate uh, essentially one reference bit per page. So when a page is accessed, we want to set the reference bit to one. Um, and we're going to put the pages basically in the circular buffer with, you can think of it like a clock hand that's visiting each of the bits. So the clock hand is going to sweep past it. If, the, if uh, a page's bit is set to one, uh, then we're going to set it to zero. Uh, which means it, it hasn't been read since the last time we looked at it. Otherwise, we want to evict it because it hasn't, we haven't looked at it um, since our last pass. So I can show kind of a visual example here. This might make sense. So we have all these pages in our, um, our buffer pool, and let's set all of the, the um, reference bits to zero, which means we haven't looked at them. We're going to access this page one here, which means we're going to update the bit to one, we've looked at it, and we're going to have this clock hand that's going to sweep around uh, the pages. So again, the clock hand starts at, at uh, page one. It sees that the reference bit is set to one, so we're going to set it to zero. Now we're going to move on to the next page. In this case, it's page two. The reference bit is set to zero, which means we haven't looked at it since the last time the clock hand passed, so we're going to evict it. We just throw it out. We don't need it anymore. The assumption is that it, it um, was not used recently, so it's not important for us to keep around. So then we replace you know, that page with page five, and let's say that in the, in the meantime, uh, page three and page four both got access, so we update their reference bits, and kind of we can keep moving the clock hand around to reset the bits until we get back to the page one where we started. And if we notice here, uh, the bit wasn't set to, to one in the interim, so that means it's zero, it hasn't been looked at recently, we can evict it. So we can throw that out and replace it with a new page. So does this make sense? Yes, question. So the question is, um, as the, the number of pages or the size of the buffer pool increases, then uh, this, this scan or algorithm uh, has to increase linearly with it, right? So yeah, so uh, basically what, what this, this algorithm buys you is rather than having to maintain an entire timestamp, whatever that is, you know, four bytes, eight bytes per page, you can just allocate essentially one bit per page so it grows at a much slower rate. So uh, when you're doing the scan, I mean, it, it's, it's the same as, as maintaining the, the previous LRU strategy. You just you know, scan through in a forward pass um, looking for uh, pages to evict until you find one, uh, and then you can throw them out. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, the question is, is, is this replacement strategy distinct from uh, whether or not the page is dirty? So whether it's pinned? Yeah. Uh, okay, so is, is this um, uh, separate from whether or not it is uh, pinned? Uh, yes, so this is uh, just, so a pinned page is something that we want to make sure doesn't get evicted. Uh, this strategy is just to decide um, whether or not we think a page will be used in the near future so we should keep it around and not evict it. So yes, they are, they are distinct. 
Yes. Uh, so when it's added, to, so the, the question is when you add a page to the buffer, should it be set to zero or one by default? So uh, I, I, maybe this is just the, the animation here, but when a page is added, what's going to happen is the, the clock hand should already be at that slot. So we don't need to, um, because the clock hand is already at that slot, we don't need to set the bit to one because uh, what we want to know is if we've loaded it, then we know it's used. We want to know if it was used again in the time it takes the clock hands to work its way all the way back around. So that's why it's set to zero uh, when, when the page is first loaded. Yes? So all the steps have to, the clock hands always start at the same rate before the time is used? So uh, the question is, does the clock hand always start at the same like position? Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, just think about this as like an array of, of bits. And you start at the zeroth position, uh, and you work your way until you hit the end of the array, and then once you get there, you just start again at, at the zeroth position. So when you need to find a page to evict, you stop there, do the eviction, whatever, and now when you need a new page, you just scan forward until you hit the end, and then you loop back around. So it's like a circular buffer of, of uh, these bits. Yeah, so the, the statement is that you start with the, the uh, last position where you did an eviction, you continue forward from there. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yes. So, so the question is, in LRU, it's kind of on-demand eviction where uh, you only evict pages when you when you need a new one. Uh, is this the, the clock algorithm the same thing, uh, or is this some kind of like background process? Um, it, it, it could be either. Um, it, there's no. I mean, I think you could you could preemptively evict pages in LRU too. You could preemptively evict the least recently used ones to make space um, for simplicity. Kind of, we're just talking about it here as you only do it on demand. Um, but if you think about like how prefetching works, then you know if you want to go ahead and, and prefetch some pages in, and you need space, then you could do this, uh, apply this preemptively. So I, either it's the, the algorithm doesn't depend on it happening either on demand or as some kind of like background process. Yes. Uh, so you, I think your question is, uh, do you append newly added pages to the end of the array? Do you mean for the, like, the clock bits here? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, yes, so if, if, I guess, if you're making, you're increasing the size of the buffer pool, then yes. Usually what we, what we do is we have a fixed size buffer pool so we know how much space we want to allocate. So you can pre-allocate um, a a bit array that's as large as the, the frames, the slots in your buffer pool. If you want to increase the size of the buffer pool, then you have to you know, increase the, the bits in the array. Does that make sense? So the, 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 the bits, um, for, for the clock bits, are, are just for uh, the, the frame slots in the, the buffer pool. So you know that's a fixed size that you know when you start. So it's not, it's not per page, it's just a fixed array of bits, one, one for each frame in the buffer pool. Does that make sense? Great. Any other questions? Great. Okay, so um, there are some issues with, with LRU and clock re replacement policies. Um, They're susceptible to this thing called sequential flooding. So like I mentioned, the main assumption that you're making is that things that are recently used, pages that you've recently accessed, are going to be used uh, again soon. So this is good for skewed access patterns, but it's bad for sequential scans. So if a query performs a se sequential scan that needs to read every page, you're going to end up 
uh, polluting the buffer pool with pages that are read once, and then you never look at them again. So in some workloads, kind of what ends up happening is that the most recently used page is actually the page, it's unneeded, you, you're not gonna look at it again. So I'll just show a quick example of this, um, how that might look. So this query again, query one, uh, needs to scan through all of the pages to find where ID equals one. So first we're gonna get page zero, we're gonna load that in. We have uh, query two come in uh, at the beginning here. It's gonna do a bunch of scans and now we get down here um, to, to page three, query one sleeping. Uh, well, what's going to happen is now query two needs a new page. The least recently used page was page zero, so we're gonna evict that. Page three gets swapped in. Now we have query three com, uh, come online and it, uh, sorry, that's mislabeled there. Query three comes online, it, it needs to scan through. And we've just thrown out page zero, which uh, query three now wants to access because you know query two evicted that, that was the least recently used. Um, query three now has to, to have this kind of thrashing that happens where uh, pages that were used uh, uh, least frequently aren't going to be needed again. So I, I, are there any questions about that? I just wanna try and hurry up here. Uh, there's a few more things we have to cover and I, I also wanna allocate some time to the, uh, the project if there are any questions about that. Great. So um, some, some better policies you could have uh, are for example, LRUK, where basically rather than tracking whether or not something, uh, just the, the most recent timestamp that something is accessed, um, you're going to look at the, the history of the last K references, so I just assume K is two for now. Uh, you, you, you keep track of the two most recent timestamps when something um, was accessed, and then you can kind of compute the interval between subsequent accesses. And you can look, okay, how, 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 what was the time interval? Was it a long time, was it a short time? Um, if it's a long time, then you know it, it doesn't get accessed that frequently, we can throw it out. If it's a much shorter time, uh, we might wanna keep it around. You can also do more advanced things if you know, think about into the future, like okay, uh, the, the average access interval between these two pages is, I don't know, every 10 minutes or something, you may be able to project, okay, 10 minutes from now I'm going to need this so you can kind of do some more intelligent prefetching there. But basically the idea is, rather than keeping around only the most recent uh, access timestamp, which in the, the sequential uh, scan case could be misleading, um, we want to keep around multiple timestamps uh, to uh, keep track of intervals. And again, there's this trade-off between, you know, how much metadata, what's the overhead of the metadata we're storing, what's the overhead of trying to figure out these intervals, and um, trying to figure out, you know, the benefits that you get from, from this uh, more intelligent strategy. So another alternative is to use some kind of uh, notion of uh, localization where again on a, on a per query or transaction basis we're um, making eviction decisions and this minimizes the pollution of the buffer pool um, but kind of you know you, you run into this struggle between the, the global optimization problem for multiple queries versus the uh, making decisions just based on uh, a single query. Um, I, another another uh, better policy might be uh, to be to provide priority hints based on uh, different access patterns. So if you think back to the index example, the the DBMS knows kind of the access patterns for um, accessing an index versus a sequential scan. So uh, you can provide hints to the buffer pool about which pages are important and which ones uh, we might not care about. So for example. Uh, imagine we're just doing some, you know, inserting some uh, contiguous IDs. Since the, the values are monotonically increasing, they're always going to get inserted kind of on this right side of our tree. So our access path here is always going to be down this side when we have to do new insertions. Conversely, if you have um, kind of a scan that you want to perform, your access path might be different. But one thing that they have in common is that you're always starting at this, at this root page. So uh, you know you always have to start at the root of the tree in order to traverse down it. So uh, one hint you may be able to provide uh, to the buffer pool manager is that you know you should keep this this root page around 
Both of these types of queries are going to need it, so it's an important thing you might not want to evict. Um, so the question about dirty pages from way back in the beginning of the class, um, there are uh, trade-offs to consider here. Um, so it's fast. If you have a page in your buffer pool that's not dirty, you can just drop it. You can overwrite it. We don't need to keep it around uh, because there have been no changes and it's backed up on disk. We can always get back to it if we need. So we can just overwrite it. Uh, it's slower if you have to evict dirty pages. So the, the DBMS has to go and get the page, write it back to disk to ensure that the changes are persisted. So there's kind of this trade-off um, between fast evictions versus the, the writing dirty pages um, if based on when things will be, will be uh, read, read or accessed again in the future. So typically what you'd prefer to do is to evict um, non-dirty pages because you don't have to incur any writing, you can just overwrite them directly. Uh, background writing process, basically uh, the, the DBMS can periodically walk through the page table and write dirty pages to disk. This is similar to kind of the question about on-demand versus uh, kind of some background process that's uh, doing the evictions. Uh, think about it just like a, an optimization the DBMS in the background could be doing. Um, when it's, you know, safely written to disk, then you can, you can unset the dirty flag, you know it's uh, persisted. But one important thing if you're doing this is you need to be careful that you don't write any dirty pages um, before the log records for the transaction, which we'll talk about logs in later le lectures, um, before the, the log, written, log records are pers persisted, as well as if uh, the, the page is pinned. We don't want to, you know, if it's currently being worked on, the transaction's not committed, we don't want to um, evict those pages. Uh, the final thing, other memory pools, so um, you know the, the DBMS needs um, memory for a lot of things other than just tuples and indexes. Um, they might or might not always be backed by disk. Uh, so sometimes things are shared by um, the the uh, buffer pool, which again is responsible for kind of buffering things between disk and memory. Uh, for other situations where you don't need persistent uh, values, for example, if you just have some intermediate query results or your caching results or you just have you know, some kind of other uh, buffering that's not you know, critical to have persisted, then um, in these cases, these can use memory pools outside of uh, the buffer pool. So you don't have to worry about kind of polluting the buffer pool with just ephemeral in memory things that you need for query processing. So uh, just to wrap up, kind of, I, I want to hammer home the point that the DBMS can almost always manage memory better than the OS. We've seen a lot of examples why we prefer uh, the OS not get involved with file I.O. and managing memory. Um, and there are lots of opportunities to leverage semantics about the query plan in order to make better uh, decisions. So that includes things like evictions, allocations, and prefetching. Um, Next class can be about hash tables. It's exciting. Well, don't have to belabor that. Uh, and now I just want to quickly go through project number one. Um, I mentioned it was released on Monday. It's going to be due uh, Sunday, September 26th at 11.59 p.m. Uh, kind of the, the, you're going to be building the first component of your storage manager, um, the buffer pool, buffer pool manager. And it has these three parts. Um, you're going to need to implement an LRU replacement policy. Uh, a buffer pool manager instance, and then a parallel uh, buffer pool manager. So you don't have to worry about like the, the disk stuff. We're going to provide you with all the code, the base code, to do uh, disk writes, disk reads, file I.O. stuff, and the page layouts. So you're just focusing on uh, the buffer pool. So I'll just kind of quickly go through these three pieces. And again, there's the uh, Q&A session where you can get more detailed um, answers if you have questions about these things in particular. So Again, the LRU replacement policy, um, you need to, to build a data structure basically that tracks the usage of pages using the LRU policy that we discussed. Um, it's important to remember to check the, the pin status of the page. You don't want to evict pinned pages. Um, and again, if there are no pages that are, have been touched since the last sweep, then you just return the lowest uh, page ID. So uh, the next piece is once you have the LRU uh, strategy set, uh, the buffer pool manager, 
um, layer is going to uh, uh, use the LRU replacer that you built to manage um, the allocation of pages. So you need to maintain internal data structures. It's going to, to track the uh, pages uh, in your page table. Um, again, we're, we're providing the, the file I.O. components, uh, and you can use whatever data structures you want. There are no, you can use anything from the, the STL, uh, what, implement it however, however you see fit. Um, one important thing to remember here is that you want to get the order of operations correct when you're doing pinning uh, for the pages. Uh, and the final piece is uh, we talked about the multiple buffer pools optimization, so you can have, you know, uh, separate buffer pools for um, different pages. I mentioned two ways to do it, either the object ID for different page types. Uh, since right now we only have one type of object in the database system, which is a table, uh, we're not going to use that one. We're going to do the second approach, um, which is hashing, where we're going to uh, it just really simple. You don't have to apply a hash function. You just take the page ID, the page number, so the identity function, if, if you want to get technical, but take the page ID uh, and then mod that by the number of buffer pool instances that you have to figure out the mapping um, from page ID to buffer pool. So just a, a few things to note. Um, please do not change any files other than I think it's six. Uh, you can double check and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's six files that you have to hand in. If you change anything else in the system, um, it may be great, but it's not going to be graded. Uh, basically, we're just going, if you submit uh, any other files, we're just going to wipe them out and consider only the six that um, need to be changed. Uh, another important point is that the projects are going to be cumulative. So we um, uh, are not going to be providing solutions to earlier product projects. So if you have, you know, if you really mess up this uh, buffer pool one and you have later um, pieces, later projects that build upon it, uh, you're going to be in trouble. So please uh, try to stay on this and and uh, keep up to date with it. Uh, and if you have any questions, post them on Piazza or come to office hours. But we are not going to be doing uh, debugging for code. And uh, one last thing, extra credit. Uh, sorry, two last things, but extra credit. What we're going to do is uh, basically you're going to submit the code. Um, since the large class, what we're going to do is we're going to take the top 20 fastest implementations so if you really optimize it, um, we're going to take the fastest implementation. It's going to get 50% bonus points on the project. Uh, the implementations that are in second through 10th place are going to get 25%, and the, the 11th through 20th place are going to get 10% bonus. And this is very important. The student with the most bonus points at the end of the semester will receive a bus tub t-shirt uh, you can ask people who are in previous sections, uh, previous years of the course. This really improved uh, people's uh, uh, dating life. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a highly sought after prize that you really, really want to make sure to get. So thank you, and I will see you next week. About the St. Ives Brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus, it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, bust it. The fuse all set, then grab a 40. The from New York and snap his neck. St. Ives. Take a sip, then wipe your lips. Cue my 40s getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E trouble, get us a St. Ives Brew on the double.